Okay, so in the first segment of uh, this unit, we started talking about what we mean by a continuum body, um, what we mean about what we mean by continuum physics uh, in, in in more generality. We looked at how we can we can uh, describe a body, how we choose to describe a body, not directly in terms of the particles, but in terms of the the space that the body occupies in three-dimensional space, right? the region in three-dimensional space that the body occupies, and also how instead of talking about particles, we label them by their position vectors. Okay? We're going to continue, um, and we're going to look now at how in continuum physics, we would represent the very same quantities that we represented earlier in the body, by looking by 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 acknowledging the individual atoms that make up the body okay so once again we have our continuum body we have our our body right and i'm no longer going to label it as b instead i'm going to label it as omega we have our axes right one thing that's useful for later but which i didn't do right now is to note that the boundary of the body we will denote as partial of omega. That partial does not really mean that we are in any sense taking a partial derivative of the body or anything like that or of the region in space. It's just notation. Okay, so partial omega denotes the boundary. Okay, um, and of course now we have the position vector of some particle, right? And we know we label that as x. All right. Let's go back to talking about mass. Okay. We want to write out the total mass of the body. The way we are going to do this is not by simply summing over the masses of individual atoms, because as we discussed, that's just too much and leaves us with too much information. Instead, we are going to introduce a continuous function, okay, and write the total mass of the body in terms of this continuous function, in particular, we're going to integrate over this continuous function, right? That continuous function is something that we will denote as a rho for density. It is a function of the position, right? It's a function of the coordinates of uh, various points on the body, and we know that we're going to refer to those points or those particles via their position vector x. So we're going to integrate the density rho over the volume omega, okay? dv is our volume element, right? So in here, rho is what we know very well as the mass density, okay? And dv is what we will call the elemental volume. Okay, or the volume element. Now, importantly, the mass density in our continuum physics description is a continuous function. Okay, it is a continuous function. Of course, it's a continuous function of position. Okay, and so this is how we go from a discrete a particle or atom-based representation of this fundamental physical quantity, the mass, to a continuous representation of it. All right? We're going to take this a little further. In particular, we're going to go ahead and do the same sort of thing with the force. Okay? In particular, the force due to gravity, F sub G. Actually, I'm going to pose that as a question. Think about how you would write out the force due to gravity also using the same idea of continuous functions. Okay? As before, I'll give you a few seconds to think about it and then we'll go ahead with it. Okay? All right, let's reveal the answer. It's a fairly simple question and chances are you may well already very well know the answer. Okay. Uh, so the way we would write out the force due to gravity, again, is going to be as an integral over omega. We're going to use this idea of this new function we've just introduced, the mass density, right? A continuous function, right? We're going to say rho of x. Now, 
the mass density, as we all know, is a scalar, right? We need to bring back the vector character of the force due to gravity. Easy enough, we just bring back our old friend, the acceleration due to gravity, right? Uh, and in this sort of representation, we will ignore the actual fact that, well, the acceleration due to gravity itself is actually a function. It varies from position to position. Let's just for now assume that it's a constant g, okay? Um, of course, in this case, g is a vector acting downward, right? g is a vector acting downward, and so is fg, right? To complete this representation, we have to integrate it over the volume once again. All right? So there we are. Again, we've represented the force due to gravity not as a sum over the discrete uh, forces, of, uh, forces due to gravity on each atom, but as an integral of a continuous function. Right? And the continuous function we introduced in both cases was this density. Okay? Um, all right, so that, th th those are uh, two examples of how we write out uh, fundamental physical quantities in continuum physics, in particular in continuum mechanics. Uh, as we go on, of course, we're going to develop this idea in much greater detail. At this point, let me give you a brief, um, a very brief outline of how we're going to develop continuum mechanics. We're going to look at continuum mechanics as consisting of three main ingredients, okay? So uh, let me put that down. Three ingredients. Of continuum mechanics. Uh, the first is what we will call kinematics, okay? By kinematics, we mean uh, motion, all right? We're going to talk about how we describe mathematically the motion of this body. And by motion, we mean not only rigid motion such as this, but also motions which involve deformations of this body, okay? So kinematics really is a description of motion, okay? Motion which could be rigid or uh, deformations. Okay, so we're going to study how to write out, how to describe the kinematics, um, that's motion or deformation mathematically, as well as an analysis of these uh, motions or deformations. Okay, so we're, by kinematics we mean motion, rigid or, or deformations, and analysis of motion and deformation, okay? That's what we mean by kinematics. The next ingredient is uh, balance laws. All right? For our purposes, there are um, three main balance laws we are going to concern ourselves with, okay? So these balance laws are um, firstly uh, the balance of mass, okay? I said three, but the second balance law really consists of two. Uh, there are two balances of momentum right, or two balances of momentum, okay? So balance of linear momentum and angular momentum. All 
okay. I have called that 1 but there is there are really 2 balances in there right balance of linear momentum, balance of angular momentum okay and the third is the balance of energy. Okay, those are our three balance laws. For the third ingredient of continuum mechanics, uh, we go to what we call constitutive laws. Okay, Now, by constitutive laws, we mean in general, we mean what is it that tells us something more about how this uh, body made up of uh, foam is different from this body, right? I, I don't mean the bottle itself or you may mean the bottle itself, but I really mean the, the liquid in the bottle, right? How is this water fundamentally different from the foam that makes up this, uh, this, this, this football, okay? Really, what is the constitution of the material that makes up the body? Hence, the term constitutive law. Now, constitutive laws can come in various forms depending upon what we want to talk about, uh, mostly in the context of, uh, of uh, continuum mechanics, uh, we are talking about stress-strain laws, okay? So, uh, let me say something more about this, constitutive laws. Literally, it means the constitution of the material of the body. Okay, so it's going to tell us something more about the constitution of the material. It's going to tell us how the, the fact that this is made out of foam is, is uh, somehow makes the constitution, the makeup of this, this body fundamentally different from the makeup of the, flow, of the liquid in this uh, bottle, okay? So the constitution of the material of the body, okay? So examples of this, uh, the most common example are what we will often call stress-strain laws or what you probably know of as stress-strain laws, okay? When we get into continuum mechanics, we will see that there are other ways to describe this instead of stress-strain laws, right? I won't get into details now, but just let's just recall that. We will, um, when we get to that point, we will actually recall that today I said that there are other ways of talking about the, constitu the constitution of a material other than just stress-strain laws. Uh, so that would be one example anyway. Uh, so, so obviously that's what we talk about if we are interested in the mechanics of a body. If on the other hand we were interested uh, perhaps in uh, how heat makes its way across this body, if we were to heat it up at this end, how does heat move through the body? There are other ways in which we would describe that. Um, in the context of, of, of heat transport, we may talk of, um, essentially, we may talk about uh, heat flux versus uh, temperature or temperature gradient laws, right? So we may talk about heat flux temperature gradient laws, okay? So those are examples of constitutive laws. These three ingredients then, the kinematics, balance laws and constitutive laws essentially make up continuum mechanics. Um, at this point, I think we can afford to take a uh, break with this segment and when we come back, we will actually get into the mathematics uh, of what we need to describe continuum mechanics.